21st century humans have come up with an awful lot of entertaining ways of filling up the few free moments in our overscheduled lives. We sing and dance, we surf and ski, we cavort and canoodle and watch TV. But what diversion do we love most of all? Man oh man, we love to spend. Now some folks say our obsession with shopping reflects a certain decadence, a certain self-indulgence. But I say every time we whip out a piece of plastic and slap it down to buy some fresh bling bling, we're taking part in a noble tradition, the evolution of capitalism. But now a new phase of capitalism is upon us, the age of e-commerce. An age that's changed the way the business works, the way we buy and sell. An age ushered in by a transformative technology, the World Wide Web, and by two of its seminal companies, Amazon.com and eBay. It's easy to forget just how revolutionary these companies were when they first burst upon the scene back in the 1990s, how they shook big business to its very core. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, corporations have always been based on the power of high-flying executives sitting in their gilded offices way up there with the consumer almost as an afterthought. But now Amazon and eBay were creating a whole new model of commerce, one based on taking the internet and harnessing the power of the great mass of individuals down here at street level. My name is John Heileman, and as a journalist, I've covered the e-commerce revolution from the start. Hanging around with the guys and gals who made it happen. The story I'm here to tell you is about the high-tech innovations that underpin that revolution and about the enormous economic upheaval that it unleashed. It's a story of a boom, a bubble, a bust, and a resurrection. And it's a story that helps explain why, despite what we may think, even the worst financial meltdowns are incredibly, amazingly, and unexpectedly a good thing for all of us. It's almost a cliche, but if you're searching for the next big thing in high tech, the best place to look is a garage. Ah, yes, the almighty garage. The place where, according to high tech lore, the greatest startups were incubated. Hewlett Packard, Apple, the list goes on and on. The garage we're interested in today was the birthplace of Amazon.com. It was in suburban Seattle and belonged to a guy named Jeff Bezos. Bezos started out on Wall Street in the early 1990s. He was highly analytical, a spreadsheet junkie. And when the web came along, he started thinking in a systematic way about its unique properties and what kinds of stuff it would be ideal for selling. He made list after list, and always at the top was books. There are millions of books active and in print around the world, and you can build something online that just couldn't exist any other way. There's no way to have a physical bookstore with millions of titles. Bezos launched Amazon in the summer of 1995. Around the same time, down in Silicon Valley, another young guy, Pierre Omidyar, was thinking hard about the web too. Today, Omidyar is a multi-billionaire, but back then he was just another idealistic software programmer, but one who had an interesting idea, the idea that would become eBay. In the beginning, Pierre Omidyar and Jeff Bezos shared one thing in common. They thought of the web as a place to do business and not just goof around. But apart from that, Pierre was from Venus and Jeff was from Mars. They couldn't have been more different. Where Jeff was about the business plan, the market research, the methodical analysis, Pierre, well, he didn't have a business plan. He hadn't done any market research. He was just a humble software coder who thought that the idea of making an online auction site sounded pretty cool. It was an idea that he could take care of all by himself, tapping away at his home computer. I thought that you could maybe use the web uh, and use the power of this technology that, to bring people in one place to create a marketplace, a market mechanism that was actually truly efficient, where regular people could compete on a level playing field with the big, big players. And so that's really, that's what I set out to do with eBay. Omidyar believed that an auction site on the web would be fairer and more accessible than any existing market. So he decided to make it happen all by himself over one long holiday weekend in September 1995. As the first visitors started trickling into a mid-year site, the pickings they found there were mighty slim. A bunch of computer-related stuff, plus an extremely random assortment of items. Autographed celebrity underwear, a toy fire engine, a superhero lunchbox. I mean, my God, 
Does this look like the makings of startup glory and transformational business potential, or a pile of useless secondhand junk? If you're thinking the latter, well, that's one more reason why you're not a billionaire, and Piero Midiar is. Some measure of success came to Amazon and eBay almost immediately. Within months of launching his site, Omidyar was earning thousands of dollars in fees. And in the first 30 days after Amazon went live, with its first employees sitting at desks made out of doors and sawhorses they'd assembled themselves, the site shipped books to 45 different countries and all 50 U.S. states. Amazon's original headquarters was in the seediest part of Seattle and was a bare-bones affair. But despite the threadbare nature of their digs, Amazon's early workers were jazzed to be part of Bezos' dream. All of my colleagues were very excited. They really felt like they had some sort of tiger by the tail. And um, you could really sense it. You know, it wasn't like going into your average workplace. They all felt like, you know, we are going to be making history here. The early success of Amazon and eBay didn't go unnoticed on Wall Street, where certain analysts were startled to discover just how fast the web was spreading. One of the most prominent was Henry Blodgett, who would become one of the poster boys of the boom and, later, one of the scapegoats for the bust. Suddenly, the company started putting up incredible numbers, quarter after quarter, and the traffic growth was so far beyond what anything anyone had ever mentioned to me. It was literally astounding to look at it and say, how could it be growing this quickly? This was explosive growth, for sure. But what was driving it? Well, to answer that, we need to get a little bit geeky. We have to understand the collision of two technologies and the pair of laws that made them unique in the history of mankind. The first technology was the silicon chip, governed by what's called Moore's Law. Coined by Intel co-founder Gordon Moore more than 40 years ago, Moore's Law states that the speed and power of integrated circuits, from microprocessors to memory chips, doubles every 18 months. Now, your first reaction to that might be, so what? The point of doubling is that if you look over time at how many steps of doubling it takes to get a preposterously large number, you don't need that many steps. So for example, to go from one to a million, you only need 20 steps. And so in very few steps, you get tremendous growth. This logic defying doubling stems from engineers' ability to make transistors smaller and smaller. And it's why computers have gone from giant machines that fill up entire rooms to super powerful laptops in what amounts to the blink of an eye. But Moore's Law is only half of the story behind the technological miracle of the web. The other half is a rule known as Metcalfe's Law, coined by Robert Metcalfe, inventor of Ethernet. Metcalfe's Law says that every new node, meaning something like your computer, that's added to the network doesn't just increase the network's value by plus one, the curve is much, much steeper than that. It's the Moore's Law of connectivity, and this is how it works. If we have two users, then that's one connection between them. They can each talk to each other. So let's add another user. If we have three users, then that gets you three possible connections. If we go to adding another user, that gets you six connections. So we're seeing some growth here. Let's jump up a little bit more. If you go to 10 users, there are actually 45 possible connections between pairs of users. So notice that the growth is quite steep, in fact. And in fact, if you go to 100 users, by that point, it turns out that there are almost 5,000 possible pairs of users who could choose to communicate with one another. And so what this really means for the growth of the internet is that the internet gathers momentum as it goes, which is to say, as the number of users increases, the usefulness of the network increases, and it becomes even more compelling over time for new users to join the network. By the middle of the 1990s, Moore's Law and Metcalfe's Law were working hand in hand, fueling an upward spiral. Faster, cheaper, more powerful PCs were increasingly connected together, making the network exponentially more useful and exponentially more popular. Though the folks on Wall Street didn't have a clue about how all this technology worked, they could see that this internet thing was really taking off, turning into a bona fide mass medium, which meant that there was a killing to be made. And when ignorance meets rampant enthusiasm and unbridled greed, well, you know what that means. It means that a fantastic financial bubble is just around the corner.
history tells us that every great wave of transformative innovation is accompanied by a financial mania. The most famous example is the railway frenzy that gripped America and Britain in the mid-1800s. Around the same time, there was a riot of speculation around the telegraph. 50 years earlier, there had been one around canals. And 50 years later, Ford's Model T ushered in an automobile bubble. In every instance, the pattern was the same. A breakthrough technology creates scads of risky startups. Investors get excited and rush in to buy a piece of the future. And then it all ends in tears. Bankruptcies, foreclosures, stock market immolations. Does that sound familiar to you? Of course it does, for it describes exactly what happened in the 1990s with the internet. The cycle began in 1995, when Netscape launched its improbable and wildly successful initial public offering on the stock market. A year later came the IPOs of search engine companies such as Yahoo and Excite. And a year after that, it was time for Jeff Bezos to take the next step in pushing the web boom in the direction of bubblehood. The Amazon IPO took place in May 1997. The company was just two years old, had precious few revenues, and no profits. But Bezos was already calling Amazon Earth's biggest bookstore and hyping its potential to the sky. People were poo-pooing it as, wait a minute, it's just a bookstore, it's not profitable, it's going to run out of money and go out of business. And then you had a lot of other people saying, no, it's Dell, it's this tremendous new model and they're going to grow so quickly. And so right from the get-go, it was tremendously controversial. Jeff Bezos made no secret of the fact that he was out to change the rules of business. One time, he and I were discussing the most unconventional and certainly the most controversial aspect of Amazon's approach. The fact that although its revenues kept rising, it kept losing more and more money. Inspiratorially, Bezos leaned across the table and said, almost nobody knows this, but we actually were profitable for a while. But it was just for one quarter, and we don't like admitting it, because it was an accident. Any time that Jeff had the opportunity, he'd lower prices so that there would be more growth. And quite unlike many other business executives who'd hold their prices to uh, make more in profit. Now, truth be told, Bezos wasn't actually saying that profits didn't matter or that Amazon could go on losing money indefinitely. He was saying that in the formative gold rush land grab moment in the development of the web, profits could and should be sacrificed temporarily in favor of rapid growth. The strategy of Bezos boiled down to three simple words. Get big fast. Get big fast was really important for us. It was our critical strategy. And the reason is we knew that we could offer customers a better experience if we had a certain amount of scale. Absolutely essential to getting big fast for Amazon was convincing customers to trust it with some of their most valuable personal information, their credit card numbers. And to understand how Amazon did that, we need to delve in to the age-old science of encryption. Powerful methods of scrambling messages mathematically had been developed long ago and employed most famously during World War II. But it was clear that something much more sophisticated was needed for the new digital age. The old method needed an upgrade because there was a fatal flaw. To explain this flaw, let's use a low-tech analogy using padlocks instead of mathematical encryption. First, imagine two people, and one wants to send a confidential message to the other. Just like a customer wanting to send her credit card to Amazon. Person one, the sender, puts her message in a box, locks it, and sends it off. But here's the snag. The sender of the message now also has to somehow let the recipient know the lock's combination, the code to unlock the padlock. This step is fraught with problems. This is when thieves could surreptitiously observe the code, steal it, and open up the box. Of course, if our sender and receiver already know each other, they could arrange to meet in secret before the message is sent and share the code. Unfortunately, of course, this mechanism is not of that much use in the context of online commerce. And the reason is, in online commerce, you want to enable confidential communication between pairs of parties who have no prior relationship. Right? It's simply untenable for Amazon to have gone into a private room with every possible future customer of Amazon. 